So you open your Bibles. I'll tell you what the title of the message is. Title of the message this morning, Eternal Thankfulness. Eternal Thankfulness. I actually love that phrase, love the message. Uh, but I shouldn't say that since I wrote it. Uh, but anyway, I love the concept of the message. Key verse, Ephesians 5, verse 20, and that is where we'll be going first, so you can open your Bibles there. Guys, being a Christ follower, are you liking the fact that I'm trying to use that word a little more than Christian? Christ follower, I hope you're catching that, that I'm using that on purpose. Being a Christ follower is an eternal lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that is focused on and even consumed with eternity. It's a just passing through this world lifestyle. If you're old enough to remember uh, the trucking uh, term, truck in term, Daryl is, right? We're just trucking. And we used to actually practice in high school in the 70s. We used to practice trucking. Um, and we're just passing through. We're just moving through this. N nobody really remembers that, huh? Okay, a little bit. All right. All right, we're just moving through this world. See, our religious culture, because our religious culture tends to give people what they want, so they come back the next week, our religious culture has tried to make following Jesus um, something that will improve your earthly life, like maybe the best double ticket, you get the ticket to heaven, and Jesus becomes your servant for life, but Christ following in the Bible is not like that. Christ following in the Bible is the most eternally focused lifestyle you could imagine, including when it comes to being thankful. We are eternally thankful. If you're a Christian today, even if you're not, even in our culture, we're aware that thankfulness to God is, um, is a normal and customary things, thing. Most of us have expressed what we're thankful for, around the Thanksgiving table or maybe at other times when we know, man, I gotta come up with something I'm thankful for. It's about my turn to talk. But there's a part, there's a part in our customary thankfulness in our even our religious culture that often falls uh, far short of eternal thankfulness. Our thankfulness often falls, falls short, it falls far short of eternal thankfulness because our approach to thankfulness, too often like the world's approach to thankfulness, our approach to thankfulness is in response to good circumstances, right? <laughs> to good situations, to material blessings. And I don't wanna be too cynical. It's right to thank God for those things. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow or turning, James 1.17 says. So everything that you have that's good is from God. But I wanna talk today about a thankfulness that's far more powerful, that is far, far more powerful. We'll call it eternal thankfulness, if you will. Eternal thankfulness is not connected to any circumstance certainly not connected to material blessing. Eternal thankfulness is the outcome, outcome of a relationship with God that surpasses the circumstances of this life. That's why Paul can say, I can move through all things with Christ, whether I'm abounding or abasing, having plenty or suffering need, because eternal thankfulness passes through all circumstances, even all material blessings. Eternal thankfulness is who God is in your life. Your ability to be eternally thankful is based on a person, is based on the personal God and him being in your life. So that's where we're going for a few minutes. Is that all right? All right, let's pray. Lord, show us a new level of thankfulness, Lord. God, don't let us be thankful like the world is thankful. Don't let us, Lord, have joy like the world has happiness. Don't let our thankfulness be dictated, determined by our circumstances or what we consider blessings, Lord. 
But God, show us that our eternal thankfulness is because of who you are and who you are in our lives, Lord. We pray, God, that we would grasp that one thing today, that we are eternally thankful people when we have you as our sole source and purpose in life. Reveal it to us supernaturally by the power of your spirit and through your word. In your name, Jesus, amen. A.W. Tozer is on the wall behind me. Well, he's not, I hope. Uh, but a quote from him is, from the pursuit of God. A.W. Tozer says this, the man who has God as his treasure, the man who has God as his treasure has all things in one. And he has it purely, legitimately, and forever, eternally. The man who has God as his treasure has all things in one. God himself, Tozer says, is our eternal treasure. And God himself is our eternal thankfulness. The reason for our eternal thankfulness is God himself and him in our lives, who he is. Guys, if you, if you scan the New Testament letters, you see more even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, the Jewish blessings were, were material, more materially focused, but in the age of grace, uh, the covenant of grace, the New Testament writers realize that eternal thankfulness should flow out of our hearts. Paul exhorts us in, in every book he writes, in essence, to live a life of eternal thankfulness. It's a life that is thankful beyond our circumstances. I, I, I wanna say in spite of our circumstances, but it's really more through our circumstances so that our circumstances are not affecting our thankfulness. One of the best verses that brings that out in a very succinct way, Ephesians 5, verse 20, where we're at today. Are you at Ephesians 5, 20? Hope you have a Bible. If you do, open it. If not, we'll put it on the wall. Or, oh, I don't see a stack of them over there today. All right. Who walked off with all our Bibles? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know where the Bibles are. Uh, anyway, uh, look on at the person next to you or look at the wall. Uh, the context of Ephesians 5 at this point is all about allowing the Holy Spirit to control your life, walking in the Spirit, being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And as we reach verse 20, verse 20 is part, a portion of the fruit. It's the evidence, the outflow of you being filled with the Spirit. Let me paraphrase Ephesians 5, 18, two verses earlier, last sentence says, be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's adding in the depths of the Greek verbs there. Be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the following verses tell us what it looks like when we are. Wouldn't it be nice if God would just write down what it looks like when we are filled with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> You know he has, right? Okay, it's in black and white in about three scripture passages. This is what it looks like when you are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Here it is, Ephesians 5, 18b through 20. End of 18 says, be filled, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, this is the outflow, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with or in your heart. Here's our verse, giving thanks always, just kind of hyphenate those words for me, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a perfect picture of eternal thankfulness, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord in or with our heart and giving thanks, our focus today, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the eternal thankfulness that Jesus Christ died on a cross to give you. He didn't die on a cross to give you the material blessings that are gonna vaporize or go to your descendants when you step off a curb tomorrow. He died for something much bigger. He died for something eternal. And we can be eternally thankful for what he died for And that's the thankfulness the Holy Spirit pours into us. When it's the Holy Spirit, we are thankful in and through the circumstances and situations of this life. Again, addressing and encouraging one another in God's word. Do you sense the the positive, uplifting encouragement there in verse 19? And then singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Have you been this person? Do you know this person? If you haven't been or don't know, find them. Just find them and like buy them a Starbucks once a week to hang around with you. You you gotta have someone around you that's always singing and making melody to the Lord in their heart. Get some of it on you, right? Okay, that's a side note. Here's our point at the end. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one we're focused on today. Guys, can I tell you please that we can know that our relationship with Jesus Christ has reached a deeper level and that we can know that we are being filled with the Holy Spirit when we find ourselves giving true thanks to God in all things. Always, in everything, we are thankful to God, not in response to what we see or what we feel or what's happening. We're thankful to God because we belong to God, because of what he's at work doing in our lives. Just one more thing about this Ephesians 5.20 verse. I believe it's back on the wall behind me. The Greek word for, for, (laughs) the Greek word translated for, F-O-R, That word can also be translated over, beyond, or in place of. When it says we give thanks always and for everything, it would be correct to translate it. We give thanks always and over everything. We give thanks over our circumstances. We give thanks beyond our circumstances would be a correct translation. And the big one, we give thanks in place of everything. We give thanks in place of our circumstances, in place of what we see, in place of what we feel, in place of what may or may not actually be happening. We give thanks because of who God is. That's eternal thankfulness. Amen? This is a transforming thankfulness. You've heard, even in, the, even in the world, in the medical community, you know, they talk about how important it is to be thankful, you know, like physically, you know, like how good it is for you to be thankful and, and to be happy, you know, they say happy. And, and so we go down and buy a bottle of wine, you know, and get thankful and happy, but the world doesn't know. That's not a recommendation, okay? That's saying the world doesn't know, but we know that true thankfulness is transforming. True thankfulness is transforming. You want to know, you want to, you want to get, you you want (laughs) to, I shouldn't say this. You want to turn some Christians away from God? You want to turn some Christians away from following Jesus? Get bitter. Just get a bitter heart. And the people around you be like, I don't know, right? You want to draw people to Jesus? Get thankful. Like, isn't Jesus, this guy right here, Bruce, is like, hey, Bruce, you know, you should have been dead years ago. You're walking around with more electronics than I have in my living room. What are you so thankful for, you know? <laughs> Ask him. He'll just say, Jesus, that's what I'm so thankful for. Reminds me of Brian Gossett there for a second. It transforms you, and it transforms the people around you. Man, so how do we do it? How do we do it? You see, we're already to the how, right? That was pretty fast, wasn't it? All right, how do we begin to grow past being thankful only for our circumstances? 
How do we grow beyond being the same thankful that non-believers are, right? How do we begin to give thanks always and for everything? Here's what I believe is the first step. This is, you know, just between me and God, but I'll share it with you. I believe the first step is developing full and complete trust in God's loving care for us and in his eternal love for us. Do we really trust God or do we only trust what he gives us? And do we only trust him when he does what we want? None of that is trust, period. We trust God when we reach this place where we have a full and complete trust in the eternal love and the eternal care of a loving Father who does not change and is faithful when we are faithless. When we develop that level of trust, we're on our way to eternal thankfulness. But there's more. Trust, here's the deal with trust. Trust includes surrender. Trust means I let go, right? Trust is, is, you know, one of my grandkids jumping off the edge of a concrete swimming pool. Uh, and there's no water. Oh, no, sorry. No, there is water. And, and I'm in the water. And I, they know I'm going to catch them. Even when they couldn't swim, they'd be like, oh, I'm going to drown if I do this. But pop-ups there, I'm going for it. <laughs> and every once in a while, I go, oh. No, I wouldn't. I would catch them every time. I never once have not caught one of my grandkids when they jumped to me in the pool. And God has never once not caught you when you've fallen into his arms in complete trust. Never. But you must jump. You must jump. You must surrender to God's plan and God's direction for your life. You must surrender to trust God and say, God, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I trust you, so I'll jump. I think most Christians hit a block wall right at this point. I think this is the thing that takes most Christians out of being eternally thankful right here. Why? Because this is a war of wills. Ooh, I like that. Someone should write a book, right? Instead of war of the world, what is it? War of the worlds? War of the worlds, right? The famous one, science fiction one? War of the wills. There probably is already a book written. War of the, this is a war of the wills trusting God. It's a war of the wills to surrender to God. It's our will versus God's will. And until our will is broken, (laughs) dare I say, pulverized, crushed, decimated. Until our will is decimated, and until we are fully and completely surrendered to God, we will not be able to fully trust God because what we want is our own will. We will not be able to fully surrender to God because we want is what our what we want is our will. And so we will never experience eternal thankfulness because we will always be thankful when God agrees with us, and we will always be angry when God doesn't agree with us because we don't trust Him and we haven't surrendered to Him. But when we do, we we'll just be like, Lord, you're God, I'm good with it. I trust you. I surrender to you fully. And I will serve you because of who you are, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. There's one bedrock foundational belief. Do you understand what what I just said? I don't mean not for what you've done in regards to the cross. The cross is everything. I mean, Lord, I'm not going to serve you because you do what I want. Okay, hello, that's not serving, right? That's saying, Lord, if you become my servant, I'll trust you. And God's like, (laughs) fat chance. Uh, (laughs) But he says it in love, (laughs) you know? All right, he's not, he's not, he he is, but uh, I mean, he's not gonna do that. He's not gonna bend to your will. No matter how many television shows you watch to say otherwise, God is not going to bend to your will. Moving on. 
There's one bedrock foundational belief that we've got to hold on to in every circumstance in life in order to gain and protect this eternal thankfulness. It's a massive truth about God that makes it possible for us to give thanks always and in everything. If you're a child of God today, here it is, man. You got to know it. If you've been adopted into the family of God through placing your full faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you love God today, you've heard it, but do you believe it? You've heard it. If you belong to God, then God is at work. God is at work for your good and for his glory in everything. God is at work for your good and for his glory in all things, in all ways, in every circumstance, in every situation. You have a loving and caring God who can be fully trusted and surrendered to, who's at work for your good at all times. And you can be eternally thankful for that. It means that God's at work behind what you see. How in the world do we judge God by what we see? How do we judge God by what we feel, by what we think? How do we bring God down to our level like that? Listen, behind the temporal, behind what's going on in this world, behind the physical, behind what you can touch, behind the circumstantial, there is an eternal God at work for your good. You can't see it, you can't know it, you can't grasp it, and you could never understand it, but it's true. There's an eternal God at work for your good behind what you see and think and feel, and you can be thankful that he is. You can be thankful that he is. Eternal thankfulness looks past the temporary situation into the eternal work of God. It looks past the present circumstance and it trusts God completely with his plan, his purpose, his love, and his care for you. Guys, it's because of who God is in our lives that we can have an unshakable faith that God is at work, that God is not sleeping like Elijah, you know, taunted the prophets of Baal with maybe he's relieving himself, Elijah says to the prophets of Baal. Listen, our God never rests. He is never not there. And he is never not at work for our ultimate good in every circumstance, in every situation. You know, if you've been around a while, you know the famous verse that boils us down, Romans 8, 28. I wish I could teach it in the context because it's actually really powerful in the context, but, but I'll pull it out of context like, like our culture famously does and uh, just drive home one point. <laughs> Listen, it's a good verse, you know. It's a good verse, but it's more powerful in context. Another day, get the Romans series. Listen to it in the Romans series. Romans 8, verse 28, here it is. And we know in the NLT. The NLT and the NIV both nail this translation. Some of the literals are forced to misconstrue it because of their commitment to literal translation. But Romans 8, 28, and the NLT nails it. It says, for we know that God, here it is, causes everything. Oh, man. The sovereign God who causes things to happen, we know that God causes everything to work together. God causes everything to work together. It was just last week in the message, turn, 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 that we talked about the tapestry of the seasons of life and how God strings all the seasons of life together to make a beautiful tapestry of our lives, including the seasons that are all knotted up and ugly. And it's Romans 8, 28 says the same thing. We know, we have confidence, we can trust that God causes everything to work together for the good. Notice, the NLT correctly does not allow us to misconstrue this to say God makes everything good. Listen, some of you have had bad things happen in your life and those things are not gonna become good. 
What does this verse say about him? It says, God was at work in them. And though his heart broke with you and he cried with you, he will cause a bad thing to work together for your good. To work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. It's a launch verse into the next verses. This verse does not say everything's good. It does not say God makes everything good. This verse says God causes everything to work together for your ultimate good. What if that's not until eternity? Well, what if eternity starts tomorrow? You know, if you say, well, yeah, but all that's just for my eternity, yeah. Yeah, it could be tomorrow. (laughs) You know, keep your eyes open. God causes everything to work together for our ultimate good. God causes the good to work together for our good. Listen, God causes the bad to work together for our good because God's at work beyond, over, beyond and over and in place of those circumstances. Those circumstances isn't what God's doing. God's doing something much deeper, something much more eternal. It doesn't mean the bad becomes good. It means that God is bigger than the bad. How many of you can say that? God is bigger than the bad stuff that's happened in my life. He's bigger. And he's so godlike this God of ours, he's so God that he can take something that was bad and use it for good. And you might say, well, I could never do that, and that gives me some peace because it means you're not God. (laughs) Uh, That's who our God is. If we will build that bedrock of faith beyond what we feel, beyond what we see, beyond what other people tell us, if we will build the bedrock of faith that God's at work for our good, that he causes all things to work together for our good, then we can develop an eternal thankfulness that's not tied to our silly circumstances or situations because eternal thankfulness looks past the immediate to the eternal. And eternal thankfulness is always trusting God that he's at work for our good. Next, Ephesians 5, 20, again, I don't think it's on the wall this time, don't remember, Uh, maybe it will be though. Uh, The end of 5, 20 tells us how can we do this by faith? Like, what what is the, what is, uh, you know, unfortunately, we've turned this phrase into some kind of a magic saying at the end of a prayer, and again, we we misunderstand it so deeply. Uh, Ephesians 5, 20 says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, here it is, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can we do it? How can we give thanks all ways and in everything to God the Father? We can do it in the name of Jesus Christ. You know if you've hung around me a while that in the name means according to the full character and nature of Jesus Christ, we can give thanks always and in everything to God the Father in the full character and nature of Jesus Christ. It's because of who Jesus Christ is in our lives that we can give thanks. It's not because our current circumstances are good or bad. Paul learned and taught us to stop looking at our current circumstances. We can give thanks to God in the character and nature of Jesus Christ because we know who he is in our lives. And so we give thanks accordingly. That perspective will change a Christian's life. Man, you got to know how many 200,000 Christians persecuted, ran out of uh, northern Iraq uh, in the last few years. Churches burned, women and children murdered, raped, and murdered. And the leaders of those persecuted churches, thankful to Jesus Christ. Wow. You drop a Westerner in that culture, he'll turn on God in a second. But these Christ followers know that God is good. The enemy's bad. God is good. 
Wow. Next, in order to have eternal thankfulness, we must fix our eyes. I, I told you before, I don't remember when, maybe last week for all I know, uh, you go where you set your eyes. Where you set your mind, your eyes direct your mind, where you set your mind is where you go. And so we are gonna look in 2 Corinthians chapter four on what we are to fix our eyes on. It's the only cross-reference. I'll throw a few more in there, but you won't have to turn. But turn to this one for me. 2 Corinthians four, verse 17. We must have our eyes firmly fixed on eternity. Really, honestly, how fixed on eternity are we compared to how fixed on our temporal circumstances we are? Does eternity consume us or do our present circumstances consume us? Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. <laughs> Try this one out. <laughs> For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Really, Paul? You must not have very big troubles. No, only being stoned, whipped, jailed, beaten with rods, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but, but, uh, <laughs> right? You have nothing to say. When the apostle Paul says, our present troubles, the ones he's going through, are small and won't last very long, yet they produce, if you're a marker in your Bible, I pray you are, meaning you mark, mark the word produce. They produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Man, get a hold of it. Our present troubles are small. They won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and is eternal, will last forever. From an eternal perspective, our present troubles are small. They're minute, they won't last long, yet they are producing, hear the word, it's a key word, they are producing for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and is eternal. Why do I point at the word producing? Because listen, the word producing means to cultivate or to prepare. They are producing for us. It's not just that Paul says you have to put up with your light and momentary afflictions, as the literal say. You have to put up with these small and temporary troubles. He's not saying put up with them. He's saying they are producing for us. They are cultivating for us. They are preparing for us an eternal glory that God has planned. Guys, our eternal glory in, in heaven is not coming in spite of our difficulties. It is being produced by our difficulties. Come on. Your glory in heaven is being produced and cultivated by the light and momentary afflictions that you're experiencing right now. You're not, your glory is not being built in spite of them. They are building the glory in you. That's what the verse says. Man. Oh, it's big, isn't it? Man, the eternal work that God's doing in your life, he's not doing in spite of your difficulties. The eternal work that God's doing, he's doing by using your difficulties. By using them to produce in you a glory that far outweighs them and lasts forever. With that, you can be eternally thankful, continuing with the fix your eyes. You still in 2 Corinthians 4? Continuing with the, the fix your eyes idea, eternal thankfulness is a matter of what you see. We're so governed, the media knows this, the devil knows this, uh, the progressive liberals know this. Uh, I didn't say that, I'm not allowed to. Um, they know that if they put certain things in front of our eyes, like let's say if you got a 55-inch director of your life, otherwise known as a television, the people who are putting the views of media on there are directing you by fixing your eyes on what they want you to fix your eyes on. You know that, right? You know that. That politics has gone to the media. The media determines what we do and what we don't do God says otherwise, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. 
So, so we don't look. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our, our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. The things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. I'm trying so hard not to use this verse with that cultural tangent I just slipped into. Uh, It's not about that. It's about eternal thankfulness. We don't fix our eyes on our circumstances, on what we can see. Instead, we fix our gaze on what we can't see. We fix our gaze on who God is and what God's doing that is eternal and how God is using these temporary problems to produce for us a glory that will last eternally. The question is, what controls your life? Do the things you see control your life? This is a really big question. I should have led into it a little bit more. Do the things you see control your life or do the things you cannot see control your life? You got to decide, am I being controlled by what I see or am I being controlled by the things I can't see as you grow in your relational knowledge of Jesus Christ as and like Aslan, like C.S. Lewis does in Aslan, for Aslan in Chronicles of Narnia, the more you know him, the bigger he gets. The more you know Jesus and the bigger he gets, the more you will say this, I don't believe what I see I see what I believe. I don't believe what I see. I see what I believe. I fix my gaze on what I believe. Eternal thankfulness is a matter of what you fix your gaze on. And if you do, you'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 18, it's on the wall, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Suffering, what's suffering? Oh, but Paul, you've been beaten and whipped and and beaten with rods and stoned and left for dead and jailed. Uh, Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's not really worth talking about. It's not really worth talking about. What's real, what's worth talking about is the glory that's gonna be revealed to me and in me. Eternal thankfulness is a perspective that every believer is exhorted to have. It's one of the great signs of a heart that's truly connected to Jesus. Please hear me. I'm not being, I am being hard on you. (laughs) Because, you know, I don't know when my eternity is going to start. Actually, it started already, but uh, I'm hard on you because I want you to hear this stuff. When a heart is truly connected to Jesus Christ, one of the marks of that heart is they know that their real life and their real blessings come through a person, not a circumstance. That they're thankful for a person, not a circumstance. That they're thankful for Jesus. Consider these three quick verses on the wall. Colossians 3, 3. Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. In Christ is my real life. This isn't, you know, the circumstances of my life. That's not real. Christ is real. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Says in him, referring to Jesus. All the promises of God are in the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ, this is what A.W. Tozer was talking about at the beginning. In Christ lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ. Christ. Christ is your treasure. It's not what he can do for you. It's who he is. And when you begin to realize that Christ is your treasure, you will be eternally thankful. Here's the question I think you have to ask. I think here's the question as we get ready to close. Here's the question that determines whether you will ever live in eternal thankfulness. Can you just, just, just bear with one more sharp word, okay, out of love? Here's the question that will determine whether you will ever experience eternal thankfulness. Are you living for yourself or are you living for Jesus Christ? That's it. That's it. 
Because if you're living for yourself and you still think God's role is to make you happy, you will never experience eternal thankfulness because you will always second guess God. You will always say, God, you're not doing it the way I want. You always say, yeah, but I want this, I want that. Because the real core problem is you're still living for yourself. Was that too sharp? Here's, here's the thing we have to know. We were made eternal creatures. We were born again to an eternal life. And eternity is not about us. It's about Jesus. And so as soon as we get the right person on the throne and say, Jesus, you are the eternal one. I serve you, we end up thankful. The most influential document that came out of the Reformation of the 16th century is called the Westminster Catechism. It sounds old, but it's actually the foundation of Protestant, Protestantism. Uh, it's a grand theology presented in 107 questions. The number one question is on the wall right now. Number one out of 107 questions to set the Protestant, the theology of the Protestant Reformation. Question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and, Lord, what, what circumstances do I need to be able to glorify you and enjoy you forever? Oh, wait a minute. I can do that right now. I can glorify you right now. I can begin to enjoy a, a deeper relationship with you right now. Actually, Lord, as it turns out, I don't need anything. I just need you. <laughs> and I'm thankful for you, right? Oh, man, that's some radical thinking <laughs> for Western Christians. <laughs> uh, a Christ follower's life is not a self following life. A Christ follower's life is a Christ following life. It's not a life of demanding from God. It's a life of glorifying God and of enjoying him forever. You can choose to do that today. Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. Whatever you do today, Whatever you do this week, do everything in the name, according to the full character and nature, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wherever we find ourselves today, we can begin to glorify God and enjoy him forever, and we can be eternally thankful for that. And I promise you, as you do, you will be. As you begin to glorify God and enjoy him, you will be eternally thankful thankful. Our life should be a life of eternal thankfulness. It goes beyond our circumstances, goes beyond our situation. We're not driven by the temporal things of this world. We're driven by heaven. We're driven to heaven. And our thankfulness is because of who God is in our lives. And so we give thanks always above and beyond everything in the name of Jesus Christ. And may I just remind you as the worship team comes up and we pray, may I remind you that if you have fully surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, that you have the eternal God actively at work in all things for your ultimate good. And in that you can be thankful. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, we're sorry to tie you to temporal, fleeting, soon to vaporize circumstances. We're sorry. May we be standing left alone with you. And may, Lord, as we are, May we know that we have reason to be thankful. We have reason to celebrate, Lord. You, Jesus, you turn our mourning into dancing, Lord. You give us an eternal purpose in the midst of present circumstances, Lord. It's because of who you are in our lives that we can glorify you and enjoy you forever. I would just say, before we play one more song, I would just say, listen, 
Listen, if you've never done that, if you've never gone all in, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, man, do it. Do it now. Move from this temporal, soon-to-be-gone life into an eternal life with Jesus Christ. Use the most famous prayer that's actually in the Bible. It's Peter's prayer when he was sinking. Lord, save me. And you can cry that out today right where you're at. Lord, save me. Save me in the midst of where I'm at, Lord. Save me in my trials, in my struggles, in the darkness I brought into my own life. Lord, save me. Save me, Lord. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life. Be my Savior and be my Lord. And draw me into a closer walk with you, Jesus, that I would be eternally thankful. It's in the full character and nature of who you are, Jesus. It's in your mighty and holy name we pray. Amen.